Hey, um, uh, some of you have done the pre-reading and are basically going, wow, we get to watch Jeff deal with some really heavy passages today. If you're visiting and this is your first time coming to church, boy, is this going to be fun for you, all right? Um, if you haven't gone to church in a long time, you're like, uh, what is going on? When we made the commitment to go through the book of Deuteronomy, we made the commitment to go through the book of Deuteronomy. And if you've been around me, I don't skip. Uh, we, we have only skipped things in the book of Deuteronomy we've already dealt with in past chapters. And so today, we have some heavyweight stuff to deal with. And, and I'm going to tell you, hopefully, contextually, you'll understand why this was being given to Israel, why it was being said by Moses to the people, and specifically even why it affects us today. So let me just remember, remember why we're doing the book of Deuteronomy. They were moving forward, but they had to look back as to why God had called them to be his people. And as we as a church... We are moving forward. We are trying to find a new location. We're trying to do these things. We never want to forget why we established ourselves in the first place, which is to love Jesus Christ and to do that which is right in his eyes. And so that's why we're going through these passages. So if you're ready, here we go. Deuteronomy 21, verse 1. If in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess, uh, to possess someone is found slain, lying in the open country, and it is not known who killed him. Boy, what a great way to start a sermon series, all right? So, if you find a dead body laying in an open field, this is what you do. Then your elders and your judges shall come out, and they shall measure the distance to the surrounding cities. Okay? So we find this dead body, they take a measurement, and they go, this body belongs to this city because you're the closest, all right? Now, why is that important? One of the things you need to understand is that murder, specifically in the place of Israel, the taking of a human life, was significant. Obviously, it's one of the Ten Commandments. But the context was a slain life not dealt with by a city would mean that city would have that on them. Now, you're going, okay, so, so what's the deal? The deal with that is, is, you have to understand, the context is, is that there's to be responsible, responsibility for each other. If someone dies and it's within your city and you're the closest city, you're taking responsibility. And so what they would do is they would measure to find out, okay, this city, you've got to deal with this. Watch what happens next. And the elders of the city that is nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer, that has never been worked, and that has never pulled in a yoke. So you have this heifer that is basically a brand new. It's going to basically not have been used at all, and there's a purpose to that. There's a purpose to the fact that, that it, there's nothing that's done wrong. There's nothing that it is done to do any work. And watch what happens next. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, which is neither plowed nor sown. So two things. The Heifer has never done any work, pulled a yoke, and the field itself has never been plowed or sown, and this is what must take place. And you shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Now that's brutal. That's brutal. This city's got to come, find a valley that's never been plowed or sown, find this heifer that's never been worked, take that heifer down to that place and break its neck. Why? Because there was a death that happened in their midst, and they have to find a way to deal with the fact that there is something that has happened, and there has to be not atonement, but there is a sense of like, God, this is not us. We did not cause this to happen, and this blood is not on our hands. Watch what happens next. Then the priests and the sons of Levi shall come forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word, every dispute and every assault shall be settled. And all the elders of that city nearest to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall testify, our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it shed. Now let me tell you why this becomes significant. This becomes significant because they cared about what happened within their city. They were responsible to what happened within their city. And if someone was slain in the vicinity of their city, they had to take responsibility for that. And also be able to say, listen, we didn't see this happen. We didn't do this. And God, please do not put the iniquity of this person on us. 
Don't put this situation on us because we have no connection to it. It even goes farther. You know, we didn't turn this person away. Maybe the person came to the city and, and we turned them away and that's why they were slain in the, in the land. No, we had nothing to do with this. Now watch what they had to do. Wash their hands over the heifer. Well, we know a story that's very similar of that to the New Testament. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. The thing that's interesting what Pilate did is this. In the story that we're talking about in the book of, De- book of Deuteronomy, we have a story where they're going, look, we didn't see anything. We don't know anything. This is not on us. The problem with Pilate is Pilate knew Jesus was innocent and let this happen anyway. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent and yet tried to do this hand-washing thing to say, hey, it's not me, it's all you. But here's the thing that you need to get in both contexts. We are responsible for what happens on our watch. We're responsible. And I know that we live in our city, and I don't know if you live in Newark or you live in Union City or Fremont or Hayward or wherever you live, but isn't it interesting that in our time, we honestly don't really think about that much that happens in our city. It's like, well, didn't happen on my lawn. And yet, there is a responsibility to what's happening within the city, and there was a responsibility to Pilate of what happened on his watch, and he tried to absolve himself of it. Look what he said. And the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Not only are they going against Deuteronomy, they're looking at this innocent man and saying, look, let his blood be on us. The priests were washing their hands to say, this blood is not on us, and yet they put the blood on themselves and their children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So folks, what we have here is that in the book of Deuteronomy, there is this essence that you are supposed to take care of your fellow man, but even someone who died in your land, you are supposed to make sure that you had nothing to do with it, and yet the people of Israel said, let the blood of Jesus be on us and on our children. Folks, we are responsible what happens on our watch. We'll talk about that more in just a second. Go back to Deuteronomy, verse 21, verse 8. They are to say, accept atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not set the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel, so that their blood guilt be atoned for. So this atonement is not a sin atonement, like, but it's this idea, don't let this blood guilt come in. Let this breaking of the neck of this heifer and the washing of this hand be for us that, God, you will not hold this city responsible. Because again, murder that happened on your watch, you took responsibility for. So you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. When you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And folks, we are called to do what is right in our community. We're supposed to be doing what is right. And I will tell you, it is very easy for us to turn a blind eye even though we saw it act like we didn't see it. And yet God would say, that is not community. And that is not what I hold you to. Now, this next passage becomes really fun. Ladies, hang with me to the end. It's going to get messy, and then I'm going to redeem myself at the very end, all right? Here we go. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to, be, uh, home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails. Now, what's interesting about that is, is if you read that, you're going, God, you, you, first of all, you've taken her captive, you take her home, right? And you shave her head and you pare her nails. That's not what it says. It says what? She shaves her head And she pairs her nails, which means cuts her nails down. It gets better. And she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament her father and mother for a full month. After that, you may go in to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. Can I tell you, this sounds like it's being cruel to this captive woman. Can I tell you, it is actually actually the opposite. 
Remember, why did he choose her? Because she was what? So guess what she does? She makes herself not beautiful. She shaves her head. She cuts her nails. She goes and for a month cries and wails in his house for a month. Do you get the context of what this woman is doing? You are going to get the worst of me for a month. And if you still want me, it's on. But if not, release me and set me free. You see what's happening? It's actually a blessing to this captive woman that this guy sees her. Oh, she's beautiful. I'll take her home. Are you sure? Zzz, right? Are you sure? Ah! Right? For a month. I'm going to let that just sit right there. And I'm going to say to you ladies, this was truly a way because here's the deal. She got captive. She didn't choose to marry him. Now this. And so it's the idea of like, this is a think twice situation. Right? But at the end, if he wants to, now watch this. But if you no longer delight in her, so he has married her, and you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. Now that is key. Typically, in other cultures, if you took a woman captive and made her your wife, and you lost the light in her, you would turn her over for money, or you would make her your slave. Notice what God is saying. You will not do that to her. If you take her into her home, you survive the month, and in that process, take her as a wife and lose the light in her, you will let her go wherever she wants. Watch this. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. Isn't it interesting that God is looking out for the weak in this context? And he's saying, hey, listen, I understand you took captive, but you will not make this worse by then turning this around because, oh, I lost interest in her. What you're going to find out in these next few passages is we have a God that actually is looking out for those who are weak. Now, remember the context. They are going to be going in to establish Israel in the promised land. These rules are meant to say, listen, we're not going to be like everybody else. You don't get to be like the pagans who just grab some woman, take her home, and thinks they can do whatever they want. He is setting precedent for them to say, you take seriously the choices that you make. Watch this. If a man has two wives, which by the way was not appropriate, but if a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children. And if the firstborn song belong, son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possession as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as his firstborn in the presence of the, to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. Watch this. But shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstborn of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Hey, listen. You have two wives. You love one and don't love the other. The other one you don't love gives you a son first. You do not punish that child. You do not punish that child. Again, this is a passage that deals with, listen, that is a passage that deals with protecting the weak. You make choices, and you think you can just do whatever you want? No. I'm going to tell you, even when it comes down to who you give your inheritance to, you will do right by me. Do you hear God's tone? Do you hear God's heart in this? Now watch what is next. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this is our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, 
We can't do this today because I checked. <laughs> but I will say to you, there is a statement here that you need to understand. Remember, they are about to establish this new time in the land. And here's what's happening. God takes seriously, and by the way, we listen to this in the post. Can you imagine as a kid hearing this in the pre, where mom and dad goes, um, yeah, we will take you to the city gate. That's a pretty good deterrent, is it not? But it would be a bigger deterrent by the kids themselves. Because the issue is this. Folks, we have seen it, and we've seen it in our own society. Those kids who, by the way, do not listen to their father and mother, who do not listen and are basically doing nothing but being drunkards and gluttons, they are a pariah on our society. And it's interesting that God says they are an evil that needs to be purged. Now, by the way, there is nowhere in Scripture that we see this actually taking place. But I will say this. I still think it's a standard where when you have a God that says, listen, I don't put up with this. I do not want us putting up with where someone who, by the way, remember, in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother that you may live a long life, right? Because if you don't, this is the option. Because, folks, we understand in our community when those who are just going to take and take and take and not be under the authority of their family, what it does to us as a culture. Now, what's interesting is we think about that, taking them to the elders. By the way, it says the elders stoned them to death, right? Brett made the joke. He goes, well, I hope they have some young guys because I don't want a 96-year-old guy throwing rocks at me for an hour, right? I mean, you know, if you want to, it's going to happen. Let's get this over with. But the idea is, that's Brett, not me. Um, but I want you to understand this. Watch this. The attitude is this. The elders of the city understood this is a problem. But what about the church? Would God have said anything this strong in the church? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 7. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man, I'll explain this in a minute, to Satan. That's pretty severe. You are to deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The context was this was a man that was doing something that was inappropriate. Matter of fact, honestly, completely inappropriate. And they had been putting up with it. And they say, no, no, no. When you come together and worship and my spirit is present, you hand him over to Satan. What does that mean? You have nothing to do with him. You cut him off from the, from the church family. You cut him off from support. You cut him off from everything. Why? So that he will have the full weight of his sin. So yes, even though his flesh may be destroyed, his soul could may be saved. But isn't it interesting that the leadership of a church is to take serious what happens in their midst? By the way, this is not someone who is coming in who is a non-believer. This is not someone who's coming in who sinned last night and just rolled into church. Oh boy, we got to ex excommunicate you. This is a follower of Jesus Christ who has accepted him as his Lord and Savior and is starting to play games with what they should and should not be doing with God. And as leadership, our job is to say, you are out of here. You are out of here. You do not get the fellowship because what you are doing honestly undermines the church. And folks, those of you that have been in church a long time know how many leaders of churches, elders of churches have fallen, and by the way, never fully repented and what that has done ultimately to that church. We are called in the same way that a son who is lazy and will not listen to his father and mother, if we have a follower of Jesus Christ who becomes defiant to Jesus Christ, our job is to put them out of the church. And I'm just being honest with you that in this process, God takes this very seriously. Now, I want to say something to you at this point that might be hard for you. Specifically, if you are coming to Christ, you, you haven't become a follower of Christ, and I want to kind of say something that will be new, and you can ask me about it afterwards, and you can even challenge me on it. We have a society that believes the number one priority is to live a long life. The number one priority is to be happy. 
The number one priority is to get mine. The number one priority, and I will tell you, that is not found in Scripture. God's priority is that you live rightly. Even if it means, means you die early. You live rightly, righteously. You uphold his name above all things, even if it means that your time on this earth is shortened. And what happens is we have a world that says, oh, what's most important is life. No, in God's world, what's most important is right, righteousness and holiness in his name. Your boasting is not good. Do, not, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Little tiny little leaven will make that whole lump rise because of how it affects. You let sin stay within your church from someone who's a believer that has done that, and you will destroy what God is doing there. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may have a new lump as you really, as, um, as you really are unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ wants his church, for those who call upon his name and name him as their Lord and Savior, that we are righteous. And if we are not righteous, we are called before leadership. And if we do not make a change, ultimately, we are asked to step out. The same attitude of what you would do with a lazy, gluttonous, drunkard son is the same attitude of what should be happening in our churches today. Again, not with those who are searching for Christ, but for those who have said they've already claimed him as their Lord and Savior. Clear? Let's move on. Deuteronomy 21, 22. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. So let me explain. So a man is stoned for whatever reason. He, he cheated on his wife. He did whatever. Most communities would take that person and then hang them up on display. Basically a sign that says, don't do this. We're taking this seriously. I think if you're in town and there's a guy hanging up for cheating on his wife, you're kind of going, wow, they take this kind of seriously. By the way, the Romans had this down. By the way, when you came in Rome, when they knew they had a lot of people coming into their major cities, would crucify as many as they could and put them on the road. So as you walked in, you're, they were like, this is what we do to people who mess with our town. But here's what's interesting. Notice what it says. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but, shall, but, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for inheritance. So if you stone a person, put them on the tree, hang them up for those to see, you better take him down that day, bury him that day, do not let him go overnight. Now why, is I, why does that matter? Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. But isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting that God did not let his son hang on that tree overnight? Roman crucifixion could take days, and if they kept giving him fluids, could sometimes take weeks. Jesus, that day, is put on the cross, dies that night, and is buried that night. Even God, with his son, kept his own law that he gave to his people in Deuteronomy. But watch what it says. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive a promised spirit through faith. Folks, what we have in Jesus Christ is someone who is willing to become the curse for you and I. To be hung on a tree for you and I. So that we could have life. And yet his father says he will not hang there overnight. And they didn't have to break his legs. And they took him down because he, his heart was broken because of the sin of you and the sin of me that crushed him. And he took our sin and took it as far as the east is from the west as he took it to hell and honestly left it there. That is the beauty of Jesus Christ. And yes, he was willing to do the curse of being hung on a tree. That's the thing that's so crazy when you have this idea that Jesus being hung on a tree, that would never be done in the Jewish custom. All of their, their killings were done by stoning. But they handed over to the Romans who would hang him on a tree for you and I to have life. Chapter 22. Now, I, okay, 
So 21 of these sections. This is what you do if someone is slain in your land. This is what you do if you have a captive woman. This is what you do if you have a son from the unloved uh, wife. This is what you do with a son who is lazy. This is what you do if you have someone hanging on a tree. Now we're just going to get random laws. These are fun. A lot funner than what we just dealt with. You shall not see your brother's ox or sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. You guys are like, so glad that's in the scriptures, right? But here's the point. You're out there and all of a sudden you go, oh, look, there's Johnny's sheep. Uh, right? No, you're to take responsibility. This last Monday... We went to the beach, and we took Lily, quit laughing, we took Lily. We thought it was going to be great. So Lily's on the beach, she has her collar on, something spooked her, she got out of her collar, gone, bye. She went running up into homes, we, we were like, wow, right? We now have her dog tags, everything on her collar, she is gone. Nice knowing you. She found her way back, found us on the beach. All of it found us. And we're like, you know what? We're smart people. Let's put her dog harness on. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to have this happen again. So we put her dog harness on. Spent the rest of the day, went to downtown Santa Cruz, uh, you know, went to Pizza My Heart, had a great time, walked around, went to the boardwalk. I swear to you, I did not know that it was humanly possible for a dog to get out of a full harness. <laughs> I was wrong. I'm standing outside the boardwalk. Jody's on the beach with Zach. Ben is inside the arcade having fun. Lily twisted, tweaked, and the next thing I know, I am holding a leash and a harness. And Lily is gone. You guys know the boardwalk. She, hit, she ran for the homes. This fat guy's chasing her, all right? And people are like, she's way ahead of you. Yeah, I, I got that. Thanks. That's awesome. I'm not getting her back, all right? So I went to this place where they do the volleyball, and I'm sitting, and I'm literally in this emotional state of going, twice in one day, how do I tell Zach I lost his dog again? <laughs> and I'm holding this harness going, it didn't break, it, it, it's, wow. About five minutes later, she comes hauling down a hill. Cars are coming out of her. I jump in front of cars to stop them. Why, I do not know. She doesn't like us, obviously. <laughs> she runs, she runs around me, mocks me, like, try to catch me. <laughs> Finally, she gets tired, lays down, says, scratch my belly, that's when I grab her. I tell you all that to say this. If you see Lily running around, Scripture says, you've got to bring her back to me. <laughs> Just saying. Even if she doesn't want to come, you got to bring her back to me. <laughs> you shall not see your brother's ox or sheep going astray, ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house, and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. Enjoy her, by the way, if you find her, all right? <laughs> and you shall do the same thing with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses, and you find you may not ignore it. Why is this in Scripture? Because of this. This is about civility. This is about the small things. And he, this is what Moses is trying to say to the people of Israel. When you go in, you are responsible for your brother. You are your brother's keeper. You are responsible for the things that he's lost. And in the same way that you would hope that someone would give you back your lost garment, you give back their lost garment. And by the way, it goes down to how we're going to be within our community. And that we care about that. That we care to reach out to our community. We care to say, this matters. And what happens is, is that honestly, we stop caring. Well, if I only care what happens in my front lawn. No, you care about what happens in your street. You are responsible what's happening with your neighbor. You are responsible with what you see. You are responsible because if we live that way, we have better community. Do we not? We have better community. We have a better expression. I'm going to give you a story. It is a sad story. I'm going to tell you right now it's a sad story. We were living in Colorado. We'd only been there for a little while, and we see this black dog just running around going crazy. Tried to catch him, tried to catch him. 
We didn't know what was going on, but we knew something was wrong. Ultimately, we got the black dog to come onto our lawn, and it died on our lawn. Come to find out, it had drank in antifreeze and was literally burning from the inside out and was trying to stop this burning. It was just running everywhere trying to find water to stop what was going on, and it died in our front lawn. We found the family who owned that dog, and I can tell you, and, and they were broken up, and they loved their dog. And we, we offered that we would bury the dog for them and do whatever we could for them to say, hey, but can I just say something to you? We cared about our community. Those people who became friends of ours started even attending our church. Why? Because the idea is we care. And, and I can tell you what, there's a lot of people who are like, well, that dog died on my lawn. I'll just move it to somebody else's lawn. Folks, these passages are telling us to care for our community. beyond the out. Because, folks, as good as our community goes, doesn't it not go better for us? And yet, a lot of us have siloed into our homes to say, well, all I care about is what happens in my house. By the way, if you do that, then what you're going to do is offer to your children a worse place than you received. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, this last one, you're going to go, Jeff, you've got to be kidding me. Here we go. If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground, which with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or the on the eggs, you shall not take, take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young may, uh, you may take for yourself that it may go well with you and that you may live long. Are you kidding me? You're going to tell me it will, I will live longer if I let the mother go and keep the eggs. This is in Scripture? Yeah. You know why? Because there's a message here. The message is this. If you come along and there's a bird that has eggs, and you take the mother and the eggs, what have you done? You stop that process of what that bird's going to offer to that community, and you took it all for yourself. If you let the bird go, the bird can have more eggs, which can bless and continue to do this. It is a small, tiny picture of this idea that what you don't do in your community is you don't take it all for yourself. You let this thing, you let the mother go because the mother's the one that can continue to bring, bring blessing to that community. Listen, people watch, they had their oxen, they had their donkey, they had their sheep. They had control over that. But many of the birds of the air, they just got the blessing of having them around you. But if you took both the mother and the eggs, what you're doing is you're saying, it's all mine. And I don't care about you. Isn't it amazing? In a short story of the bird and the eggs, we hear, yes, take the eggs. Raise up more birds or eat the eggs or do whatever you want. But make sure that bird goes so it continues to be a blessing in the community. God help us. God help us when we take all things for ourselves. <laughs> okay. Verse 8. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. This is the rule. If you have idiot friends that fall off the edge of your house, try to protect your idiot friends from themselves. You think I'm kidding? Homes were built with flat roofs. You lived on the top of your roof. What they're saying is, build a parapet. A parapet means just a little short wall, so that way when your friends are there, they don't fall off your house. Think of your friends who are not smart enough to not walk off the house. Now, this would blow you away, except I've been to Mexico and built houses and watched people on roofs. It is amazing to me. You're on a roof, right? I watched one of our, she was rolling out tar, tar paper, walked right off the back of the roof. Brett tells a story of a friend of his. He was, someone said, hey, how, how, how far do I have to cut that board? He goes, about this long. As soon as he did, a girl fell off the roof and landed in his arms. That's kind of a good spot to be in. But isn't it amazing that the attitude is this. When you build a house, you might have idiot friends, build a parapet, kind of protect them from their own idiocy. There you go. All right, now. In this whole context, we have some heavyweight stuff. 
But I want you to hear the heart of God as we look at this. We have a heart of God that goes, I take care of those who, by the way, can't take care of themselves. I want to give the captured woman a chance to not be stuck in this marriage. I want the young son who, by the way, it's not his fault that you love her and not his mother. I want you to understand that if someone's slain in your midst, it matters. And your city should be taking responsibility of what happens within its city. And you should care. And also, you should care about your neighbor's lily. Watch out for your neighbor. Take them back. People don't understand that we don't want her back, but they keep bringing her back. So in that, I want you to know that there's a societal aspect to that. And it's important. And at the end of the day, what I don't want you to forget is we have a God that was willing to be the curse for us so that our curse would be taken from us and that we could have life. My hope for us as we read these random laws, and I know some of you, some of you guys, I just, you, like, you just read and went, okay, let's see what Jeff does with this. Read deeper. See that we have a God that was trying to say something to his people that, by the way, he is still trying to say to us today. Your community matters. Your, the, the civility of your community matters. What happens on your watch matters. And be aware. And be aware. Even when it comes to letting the mama bird go so that she can bless your community as well. And with that, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your word, and I know that we have more of this stuff coming as we go through more chapters of Deuteronomy, and you're going to be challenging us to ask these bigger questions as to what are you doing and what are you saying. But today, God, I would ask that you would encourage us with your word, that we would find ourselves blessed because of our time in it. Father, you are an amazing God, and your word truly blows me away. And may we live it, Father, to the full as we trust in you. God, you are an amazing God that we want to put all of our hope in. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.